Some of those potatoes you left in your pantry have turned green. Are they still safe to eat? When these vegetables come in contact with direct sunlight, they turn green because of a little thing called chlorophyll. It's a green pigment plants need to produce food during a process called photosynthesis. To prevent potatoes from turning green, you'll need to store them in a dark and well-ventilated area. While chlorophyll itself is harmless, once the amount of this substance increases in a potato, it triggers the appearance of another element called solanine. This is a substance found in tomatoes, eggplants, and most importantly, potatoes. Not only does it make these vegetables taste bitter, but it can also cause serious health problems, for example, related to digestion. Hmm. While it's best to refrain from eating green potatoes, you can always double-check if they are good to eat by tasting them. If you sense a taste of bitterness, it's best to throw them away. What about sprouted potatoes? Are they good to eat? Well, it depends. That substance solanine has a lot to do with it again. If a potato otherwise looks good and only has a couple of small sprouts, you can remove those and safely eat the vegetable. They won't be the best-looking potatoes, though. So if you want to cook a dish where you need neat vegetables, you might want to skip the slightly sprouted potatoes and use them for something else, like soups or mashed potatoes. But if your potato looks like it's grown arms and legs, (laughs) you'll be on the safe side if you throw it away. Solanine aside, it will also taste bitter, so you might end up cooking it for no good reason at all. Let's look at some other tips to help you improve your kitchen safety skills, like how you should wash fruits and vegetables with hard rinds, say melons or cucumbers. Simply running water over them may not be enough to get rid of all the nasty stuff on their surface. Best to use a sterilized scrub brush and some elbow grease to really get into those ridges and clean the vegetables properly. That way, the dirt and bacteria won't transfer from your veggies to your cutting knife or board. A fan of grilled meat? Might want to get a food thermometer to make sure you're always on the safe side. If you're an experienced cook, you might be able to visibly judge if the meat is ready. But if you're really not sure if the product is done, a thermometer will be your best friend. Specialists claim that whole cuts of meat need to reach a minimum internal temperature of 140 degrees Fahrenheit before you can serve them. Fish needs to reach 145 degrees, while ground meats need a minimum of 160. Poultry or pre-cooked meat, like hot dogs, need to be heated to at least 165 degrees. To safely store all the food you've bought for the rest of the week, you also need to make sure that your household devices are working properly and are set at the right temperatures, like your refrigerator temperature, for example, which should be at 40 degrees or lower. As for the temperature in the freezer, it should be 0 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. Now, that thermometer I mentioned earlier can be of use here, too, if you need to check whether your appliances are working properly. Luckily, most of these devices come equipped with their own thermometers these days. Do you need to bring your own food to your neighbor's barbecue party? Make sure to keep it cool on the way. Meat, poultry, and seafood need to be transported at 40 degrees Fahrenheit at most. You can always use an icebox. Just make sure to place its cooling parts in the freezer the night before. The way you organize food in your fridge can affect its quality, too. Raw meat, for example, needs to be stored on the bottom shelf of your fridge. It's also best to keep it away from fresh produce and ready-to-eat dishes. Now, have you experienced a long power outage recently? Sorry, but all the food in your fridge needs to go. If your fridge was offline for only a couple of minutes, you're most likely safe. Otherwise, you'll need to get rid of all the perishable foods. When it comes to canned food, you also need to take into consideration its acidity levels. Products that are high in acidity, like tomatoes, grapefruit, and pineapple, can be stored for 12 to 18 months if unopened. Canned vegetables, meat, poultry, and fish can be stored for longer, anywhere between 2 to 5 years, if the storing conditions are right and if the can itself remains undamaged. If anything looks rusty or has bumps on it, remove it from your pantry. You also need to be careful with storing your acidic food, as you should never use reactive pans. 
You might know that aluminum is used a lot in cookware because it's good at conducting heat. But cooking or storing something in an aluminum pan might not be so good for your food. Tomato sauce, for example, can damage aluminum or cast iron plates, and that will show in both the taste and the color of your food. Non-reactive pans are your safe bet, so make sure you invest in a good quality stainless steel, enamel-coated, or glass set of pans. A lot of dishes taste better if you pre-marinate the ingredients. Just make sure to always marinate food in the refrigerator. If you leave it outside on your counter, it'll soon reach room temperature, and then bacteria will start to multiply. And it may be dangerous if you don't cook that product at a high enough temperature afterward. Also, never reuse the marinating liquid. Now, the first rule, whenever you're gathering tools to prep for dinner, multiple cutting boards for each type of food. One should be reserved for meat and seafood, while others should be divided between vegetables, fruit, and baked goods. It's the best way to avoid cross-contamination in the kitchen. And speaking of cutting boards, your best bet would be to invest in a good bamboo one. This material absorbs little to no moisture and isn't easily damaged by knives. It's way more resistant to bacteria than any other type of wood, and it also lasts longer. Not to mention the fact that it also looks really cool. Eggs can cause a lot of trouble if not stored correctly, but here are a couple of tips you can use. Fresh eggs are safe to eat for up to three weeks after purchase. Keep them in their original carton. Hard-boiled eggs need to be consumed within the week, no matter if they still have their shells on or not. Lastly, if you keep leftover egg dishes in your fridge, make sure you eat them within three to four days. Now, we all want our batter to be smooth and free of lumps, don't you? But overmixing can be bad for your dish, too. Way too much elbow grease can cause gluten to form in the flour, which will give you a really tough batter. The trick is to mix lightly just until the batter is homogenous. Dried pasta comes in all sorts of different shapes and sizes for a reason, you know? That's because you should be pairing a specific type of pasta with the texture of the sauce. Like pasta shells, for example, go better with denser and chunkier sauces. Why? Because the sauce is gathered inside the shell, making it easier to serve and eat. The ribbed outside surface also helps with covering the shells in the sauce. Next time you mess up a tray of cookies and end up burning them, you can save them with your trusty grater. Just grate off the blackened parts from the bottom after carefully removing the cookies from the tray. Also, if you ruin their shape a bit, you can always dip them in melted chocolate. <laughs> after the chocolate gets a chance to cool down, you'll be left with perfectly shaped pastry. Wow, it's lunchtime! You choose a delicious-looking piece of chicken, but oh no! It ends up on the floor instead of your mouth. You quickly pick it up and eat it anyway. Because there is the five-second rule, you know. The bad bacteria simply won't have enough time to hop on your food off the floor if you're fast enough. But is it real or is it just an urban legend? Some folks like to credit the famous Genghis Khan, the founder and ruler of the Mongol Empire, for the whole thing. According to the tale, if food fell on the floor at banquets, it was fair game as long as Khan said so. His food was supposedly so special that it was good for anyone, no matter where it landed. Back in the day, people didn't know much about those pesky microorganisms and how they could make us sick. So, eating dropped food wasn't really considered taboo. They figured if they wiped off the visible dirt, it was good to go. And that's how the con rule came to be. Hey, maybe they just had outstanding immune systems. Meanwhile, let's fast forward to the queen of culinary TV herself, Julia Child. As she whipped up mouth-watering meals on her show, The French Chef, some viewers claimed they saw her drop lamb, chicken, or even a turkey on the floor. But in reality, it was a potato pancake that landed on the stovetop, not the floor. In the spirit of having some fun in the kitchen, Julia famously said, But you can always pick it up, and if you are alone in the kitchen, who is going to see? And just like that, the misremembered story became part of popular culture. In real life, when your food hits the floor, it's like a bacteria magnet. That chicken piece is bound to pick up some unwanted microbial hitchhikers. 
you just can't give your fallen lunch a quick sanitizing session like you would with your hands. As for the 5 second rule, it's not all so simple. Some foods may have a better chance of survival after taking a tumble. Researchers from Rutgers University discovered that moisture, surface type, and contact time all play a role in the degree of cross-contamination. Foods with high moisture levels, like juicy watermelon, are the biggest culprits for contamination. That means they attract more bacteria than any other food tested. And not all environments and surfaces are created equal. Carpet had a low transfer rate in the experiment. Stainless steel and wood had higher transfer rates. In a different study, researchers swabbed the floors around the University of Illinois in the lab, hall, dormitory, and cafeteria to see how many organisms they could find. They were surprised to see very few microorganisms. It was probably because most malicious bacteria like Salmonella, Listeria, or E. coli can't survive without moisture, and the floors were all dry. But even on dry, sterile surfaces, germs relocated onto cookies and gummy bears in less than 5 seconds. For some foods, it takes less than 1 second for the transfer to begin. So the 5-second rule doesn't really rule, after all. It's more of an urban legend and a psychological trick your mind plays on you. Experimental psychologists explain that when it comes to decision-making, we humans don't always go through a rigorous risk-benefit analysis. Nah. We rely on our brain's trusty sidekicks, called heuristics. These little shortcuts help us make lightning-fast decisions based on whatever info we've got at hand. Sometimes, these shortcuts can lead us in the wrong direction, though, like in the case of germs. Those are invisible little troublemakers, and food is real and valuable. So when you drop a precious piece of food on the floor, say, a yellow peanut M&M, your brain goes like, hey... I can't see any germs, so it must be safe to snatch it up. (laughs) Not every floor snack will make you sick, but it also depends on you. Our immune systems, especially in the very young and the very old, can be a bit more fragile and vulnerable. So it's crucial not to pass on this questionable habit to the little ones. Remember, they're always watching! Another popular food-related myth is that carbs are always bad for you. In reality, some carbs are pretty important because they're converted into fuel for our bodies. You can find those complex carbs, as they're called, in plant-based foods. They're the ones that keep our digestive system happy and our metabolism in check. The real villains are the simple carbs. Manufacturers add them to processed foods like starches and sugars. When we gobble them up, they quickly turn into blood sugar, causing all sorts of havoc. Think sudden spikes, feeling hungry again in no time, and some more serious consequences for your health. The good carbs come packed with nutritional goodies, like fiber and bran, which makes them digest slower and release glucose gradually. To make smarter carb choices, try going for whole grain bread alternatives and swap soda for sparkling water. You can also try the plate method. Fill half your plate with fiber-rich, starch-free veggies. Reserve a quarter for starchy delights like potatoes or a fruity treat. And the last quarter is for proteins. Fish, poultry, beans, nuts, eggs, and lentils should become your new dietary besties. Now, frozen or canned fruits and veggies aren't useless like the rumor has it. Studies have shown that frozen, dried, juiced, or canned plant-based foods can be just as nutritious as their fresh counterparts. You just need to keep an eye out for any sneaky added ingredients like sugars, saturated fats, or sodium. High temperatures during the canning process can cause some vitamins, like C and B, to take a hit. But those vitamins can be a bit sensitive to heat and air in general, so they might leave even during regular cooking and storage at home. Some canned foods, like tomatoes and corn, actually release more antioxidants when they're heated up. Now, have you ever tried adding celery to your diet just because eating it is supposed to burn more calories than you take in? Experts say that negative calorie foods are nothing more than a fantastical idea. Sure, the process of munching and digesting celery burns a few calories, but not a significant amount. There may be around 10 calories in a hefty celery stick, but the body only uses one-fifth of that to process it. So it's still a calorie-plus situation. Plus, you'll unlikely survive just on celery, 
and it's often a gateway to more yummy foods like cream cheese or peanut butter. Hey, tell me about it. Meanwhile, high-fiber, water-dense fruits and veggies, like celery, can indeed have value as weight loss allies. They fill up your stomach and increase satiety, preventing you from gorging on more calories later. But they won't magically burn off the calories you've already consumed. Some people claim that certain foods or beverages make your body work harder. For example, your body needs to warm up cold water to a toasty 98 degrees Fahrenheit. But there's no solid research to support the idea that cold water drinkers burn significantly more calories. Maybe a measly 5 calories if you're lucky. Caffeine, guanine, taurine, and green tea extracts have been touted for their metabolism-boosting properties. But again, we're talking about a tiny boost that could potentially result in losing around 10 pounds over a year. So, looks like the best way to keep your calories under control is to consume fewer of them than you burn through exercise, not just digestion. Carbonated water isn't any worse than its still version. When carbon dioxide and water get together, they chemically react to create a weak acid called carbonic acid. It tickles the same nerve receptors in your mouth as mustard. That's why you get that delightful and prickly sensation. Although carbonated water is a bit acidic, drinking it won't make your entire body acidic. Your kidneys and lungs step in to remove any excess carbon dioxide from your system. And it's not terrible for your tooth enamel. One study found that sparkling mineral water had only a slight impact on enamel compared to still water. It was a whopping 100 times less damaging than a sugary soft drink. So keep your bubbly drink sugar-free, and you should be safe and healthy. When we look at our planet from space, one color dominates. That's why Earth is called the blue planet. About three quarters of our world is covered with water. But there's a catch. 96.5% of this water is trapped in the oceans. And if you remember the first time your parents took you to the seaside, drinking that water is a big no-no. So why is ocean water salty and undrinkable? There are two main reasons. The first is runoff water from the land. Rainwater is slightly acidic. Its pH factor is somewhere between five and five and a half. For comparison, pure water has a pH factor of seven, and the acid we find in batteries is a bit more than zero. Such rain erodes rocks when it falls on the ground. This releases ions, such as sodium and chloride. They end up in rivers and streams that eventually empty into the ocean. Living organisms remove some of the good ions, but the rest remains. Over time, this increases their concentration in the water. Oceans have their own salt powerhouse. Vents in the sea floor let out a hydrothermal fluid. Sounds complicated, but it's easy to understand. Water seeps down the gaps on the ocean floor. Then, the magma from the Earth's core heats up the water. There is a chemical reaction that frees seawater from oxygen. It picks up metals, such as iron and zinc. The vents on the sea floor release this metallic water back into the ocean. During an underwater volcanic eruption, the process speeds up. Salt and other minerals are directly released into Earth's oceans. Over time, salt accumulates on the seafloor and forms domes. These deposits occur under dry land as well. Some places on the globe have a large number of salt domes. The Gulf of Mexico is just one example. Beneath the waves, they affect the salinity of water. Other factors that determine how salty a body of water is include evaporation, air temperature, and precipitation. The general rule is that salinity is low near the equator and at the poles. All the oceans and seas in between are likely to have high salinity. Scientists estimate that dissolved salts make up 3.5% of the weight of the world's seawater. The waters that empty into the ocean, such as lakes and rivers, are fresh water. So why is the seawater salty? To answer this question, we must travel into our planet's past. Researchers believe that primeval seas weren't as salty as they are today. But over time, rainfall washed away the rocks on land, transporting vast amounts of salt into the oceans. The process has been going on for more than 3.8 billion years. Today, some 4 billion tons of dissolved salts end up in Earth's oceans every year. The input and output of salt are fairly balanced. This means that seawater's salinity is stable. So why can't we drink seawater? 
We already take salt into our bodies with food and drinks. It is called dietary salt. The World Health Organization recommends that humans consume no more than a teaspoon per person, per day. You shouldn't go over that amount if you want to keep your heart healthy. Centuries ago, salted beef and pork were the standard diet of seafarers. Meat was preserved using salt. At sea, fresh fruit and vegetables would go bad after just a couple of weeks. Before refrigeration, this was the only way to keep food fresh. Pickling was another option for storing food. The reason why we can't drink seawater is the salt content. The percentage of this mineral in our blood is nearly four times lower than the percentage of salt in seawater. Our body simply cannot process such a high amount of the substance. When we intake salt as part of our diet, we also drink liquids. When you serve pretzels, you probably have a glass of water or juice nearby. It helps quench the thirst and keep the salt levels in check. If we drink water straight from the ocean, the exact opposite happens. We just become thirstier. Our body absorbs both water and salt. They end up in our bloodstream. The organs responsible for getting all this salt out of our blood are the kidneys. But they need water to perform their duty. The higher the salt content, the more water they need to wash it away. When the process repeats itself several times over, you become dehydrated. This is the process of losing water from the body. And there's another catch. You start releasing more water than you take in when you drink seawater. The difference leaves you thirstier than you were when you started drinking seawater. Not a good idea to begin with. But some marine mammals, such as whales, seals, and even seagulls can drink water from the sea, just like we drink tap water. The kidneys of these mammals are super efficient. Birds have special glands in their beaks that prevent salt from getting inside their bloodstream. Scientists found that the only land animal that can drink seawater is the camel. And if you ever wondered if fish drank seawater, they do. The gills and kidneys help them pump out the excess salt. For humans to drink ocean water, it first needs to go through desalinization. This is the process of removing salt from seawater, and there's a lot of it to take away. Estimates show that if we laid out all the sea salt across Earth's landmass, it would be higher than the Statue of Liberty. That's why desalinization on a global scale isn't realistic. Right now, Less than half a percent of the drinking water we produce comes from seawater. And the demand for potable water is only going to increase. The current rate of consumption means that the demand for fresh water doubles every 20 years. The biggest issue with desalinization is the energy cost. It takes 10 times more energy than other water production methods. And the carbon footprint is huge. Large desalinization plants often need to have their own power stations. This is all because of the technology behind the process. Salt dissolves easily in water. It creates a strong chemical bond with water that is hard to break. Desalinization facilities mostly use reverse osmosis to achieve this. Large pumps exert pressure on seawater to push it through a filter. Its membrane is so fine that each pore is a fraction of the size of a human hair. The filter allows for water molecules to pass. Larger salt molecules remain trapped in the membrane. For every quarter of a gallon of fresh water the plant generates through desalinization, there is the same amount of water that is now twice as salty. Hardly the ideal method of water purification. The idea that humans could drink seawater isn't new. In the mid-4th century BCE, the famous Greek philosopher Aristotle considered using a series of filters to remove salt from water. Ships in the 16th century had small, portable distilleries that could boil seawater. This was merely patchwork since exposing seawater to high temperatures doesn't make it drinkable. Such thermal processing only sterilizes the water. You would need to catch the steam that evaporates and wait for it to cool down before it's safe to drink. This is a complex and time-consuming method that is probably not worth the effort. Let us imagine for a second that we got rid of all the salt from the Earth's oceans. We would get an endless supply of drinking water. But at what cost? There are millions of animal and plant species that are adapted to salt water. These include plankton, the basis of all marine life. They wouldn't have enough time to adapt to the new conditions. Not all fish are like the salmon, which thrives both in fresh and salt water. The sudden switch would also have a profound effect on our planet. Since fresh water is less dense, it would immediately cause the ice cap in the Arctic to sink by four inches. This would trigger the largest tidal wave the planet has ever seen. 
Although the idea of desalinization on a global scale sounds good on paper, we should take it with a grain.